And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer to the temple, coming to us straight from Tale and Comics, creators of the up of the upcoming um, three-way mix of film of film noir and and um and cyberpunk. <laughs> you had it. <laughs> I, yeah, I fucked it. I fucked it up already. Um, oh, you're even, so good, I'm man. Not even it's drinking good. yet? <laughs> you want to be Jake Adams, everybody. How How's it going? Thanks for having me, man. <laughs> thanks, thanks Appreciate for being on. on. Thanks for com thanks for coming on, and thank God you're in the same time zone as me. Yeah, man. It's it's a little uh, aggravating when people are always on the eastern side of stuff, man. I can't I can't do that hour layover, man. I got to be in bed by the time people get on stream. God help like, you. I you ever have to deal with international time. Speaking oh, from experience. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> oh, it, when I try to get on with the Aussies, you know, the Bogans down there, I. I mean, I'm ready to go to bed by the time they come on, so it's always hard to watch, like, Dean and Lee and then the Barton bros. I mean, hell, even um, Michael Bancroft. I'll I'll be there for, like, one second just to say hail, and then I'll be like, I got to go to bed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now, I'd like, to open, I'd like to open with a bit of humble beginnings. Um, sure. How, to walk me through your first introduction to comic books, first off, and the and tell me how tell me where tell me where and when you were when the writing bug hit you. Uh, when I was little, I was always more into books and stuff. When when the TV wasn't on, let me just you know buff that. Nice save. But, uh, <laughs> but you know when uh when i was in school you know they still had it to where you had to sit down and read a book for an hour you know you had to check it out from the school library and all stuff like that but when i actually like got time to like sit down and like get into the book you know i would sit there and i wouldn't want to put it down mm -hmm. just i love the idea of being you know walking through a story that somebody's created uh whether it's a book or a comic it didn't matter to me i loved it and then you know as I got older, TV started being the big thing and whatnot. So books kind of went away for a little bit. And then uh, in high school, uh, the TV show that was a big deal right then on the CW was Smallville. Mm -hmm. So I started watching that, and I was like, man, this is really good. I like this. You know, the, the story of Clark Kent before he becomes Superman. And uh, I started talking to it with friends, of course, in uh, high school. And they're like, dude, you need to stop watching that shit. Here's a comic. Go read it. And I was like, all right, thanks. <laughs> so they gave me a couple comics to read here and there. And I was like, I was really enjoying it. I was enjoying the stories. I was enjoying, you know, how the characters actually were supposed to be. And I was starting to learn all that stuff within it. And um, I was like, this is awesome. Can I get a couple more? So... I started picking up my own personal copies of Nightwing. So that's what I started collecting. And you'll kind of see a little nod to, you know, those characters within Cobalt and whatnot. Mm -hmm. But um, as I started, like, getting into Nightwing and everything, uh, people started introducing me to other things, you know. I'm a, I'm a huge DC fan, but people started, like, showing me stuff of Marvel with X-Men and the multiple Spider-Men out there and, you know, trying to get me into the classics, but... I just felt like there was so much out there. I just wanted to keep it within DC, so that's what I did. I've got Green Lanterns. I've got Nightwings. I've got Supermans. And uh, I just um, I just started getting some of the black, black label stuff, like uh, Dollhouse and some of the darker tone stories. And I'm enjoying them all. Uh, and then, you know, I've always enjoyed writing since I was little, like, you know, you had to do the creative classes and whatnot, and I really enjoyed them. So I'd come up with stories. I'd kind of do, like, the Rick and Morty thing where you just mash two stories together to make one. And, uh, you know, it's it was fun. I remember, like, trying to mash together uh, Pirates of the Caribbean and Pokemon for some reason. <laughs> just, I don't know why, but I did. And so... As I got into college, you know, I was very much the theater buff. And, uh, of course, alongside that, you go with creative writing classes. And I started doing it in there, too. 
And uh, one one day, um, the teacher asked me and another student to stay behind while everybody else left the class. And she sat us down and said, guys, you are either really good writers or you guys are plagiarizing these pieces. And I was like, oh, shit. So she was like, if I put this through the system, will it show that you've been plagiarizing other uh, stories and stuff? And I was like, N- no. Um, but thanks for the compliment. <laughs> <laughs> and so, you know, that little, you know, tidbit happened there and everything. But, you know, dropped out of college and stuff. And I'm, I'm working retail now. I'm a manager in retail. And uh, back in 2013 is when, you know, becoming a comic book creator took place. So I was working in a factory before I got into retail. And uh, I had an accident within the workplace. You know, I became an amputee. I lost four fingers on my left hand. So I'm actually bionic. And so as I was going through that process of losing fingers and dealing just with, you know, the stages of grief and whatever, um, I started meeting other amputees in the community and uh, started learning that the communities, they call themselves limb different. And uh, they just don't like the negative connotations that it has to do with being an amputee and, you know, everybody looking down and feeling sorry for them and whatnot. And I'll be honest, I used to be one of those guys who, you know, when I saw somebody with an amputation, I'd be like, oh, bless his little heart. You know, that stupid Southern uh, yeah, I <laughs> quote. <laughs> I'm pretty sure. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Even if, I, even if I'm pretty, I never grew up in the South, but I'm pretty sure if, if I did, I if I heard that particular phrase, um, especially especially given my especially given my own condition, I would yeah. I would either I would either cringe or I'd probably want to wring their neck. A little bit of both <laughs> is what happens. <laughs> so, but you know, so I started meeting other uh, guys in, in uh, the Land different community, and you know, within the community, we've got bodybuilders we got people want to become actors and actresses we have authors we have very much creative juices are within that community too and uh while I, while um a couple buddies and i were down at dragon con in 2018 uh we were walking the artist alley and looking at all these independent comic creators and everybody just bringing their own stuff to the front for other people to enjoy and my buddy and I were going back and forth and he looked at me and was like, hey, man, have you ever had an idea for, you know, your own like superhero or something? And I just looked at him and I'm like, who hasn't, you know? And so I started giving like a little rough story of what I had for like an idea of Cobalt and whatnot. And uh, he was like, dude, let me get you in touch with somebody. And I didn't think anything of it. Uh, but a couple months passed by. It's It's probably late October, early November now, and mm-hmm. his buddy, Travis Rivas, who's with Accidental Aliens out in San Diego, mm-hmm. um, they're, they have like a little independent uh, comic book studio. And he was like, hey, man, I'm limb different too. I have what's called a uh, TAR syndrome, and so my arms are shorter than they should be. But what we're doing is we're making an anthology of superheroes with limb differences for these kids that are within the community. And we were wondering if you want to be part of that with uh, your character Cobalt. I was like, hell yes, I want to be part of that. So, you know, a couple months later, we came out with super abled comics. You can get on Etsy.com right now. Mm-hmm. And it's just six, you know, uh, seven page origin stories for, you know, these characters that we came up with for kids. And, you know, we've got the chimpanzee sheens in here. We've got, uh, the one-armed wonder from one of my buddies, uh, Brian, and then in the very back of the book, because they either saved the best for last, or because mine was a little darker, they put it in the back where kids will probably get bored and put it down before they get to it. Is Cobalt? Yeah. So, uh, but I like to go with the latter of saying they saved the best for last. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> yeah, to- so, totally, totally not, totally not appealing to appealing to the ego. Totally. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> Humble, humble beginnings. <laughs> <laughs> um, unfortunately, egotistical beginnings doesn't roll off the tongue as much, so I can't. It really do does. <laughs> um, oh man! No. But uh, yes. So the creative bug came from that, and I just didn't want to stop. 
So well, once, cold ball. Once it gets its hooks in, you can't you can't stop. <laughs> you really can't, man. You can't until you just you know, it just fizzles out and it hasn't yet. I just want to keep going. Uh, on my Instagram uh, tail in studio, you'll see a bunch of different characters that I have for different stories that I want to create. Mm-hmm. Of course, you know they're just sitting on the back burner because I'm trying to get uh, this Cobalt series done first. But you don't want you eyes know, bigger than your stomach. Exactly. You know, I I've, I've got a small plate. I want to eat everything on it first before I get on to the next course. Oh, geez, I'd hate to see you at buffets. Dude, I could put away some food. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, now, you've described Cobalt as a mix of cyberpunk, neo-noir, hard-boiled, and suspense. Which is right. a hell of a cocktail, but there's a, there's a couple entries in that that I, re- that I really want to really focus on. And the first of those mm-hmm. is cyberpunk. Now, sure. I've had my fair share of cyberpunk um, authors, and cr- authors and creators on the, sh- on the show, even did a panel about that um, a year ago. Mm-hmm. Um, and a lot of people, a lot of people have their own different definitions on cyberpunk or what makes yeah. what makes um, cyberpunk, especially especially those who got who got started through ver- through different things. Like somebody who whose introduction to cyberpunk was Ghost in the Shell is going to have a different definition than somebody who's who got into it through Neuromancer. That's just how it is. Oh yeah, um, most there definitely. Certain, there are certain co- commonalities, but there are certain things that aren't that are going that are going to not um, mesh as well. Um, what what was your first introduction to cyberpunk, and what what are the defining traits of cyberpunk the way you see it? The way I interpret cyberpunk is there there's a um, it 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 overlays everything in the city, like everything is just you know, overrun with technology. Mm -hmm. So, and it doesn't have to be, you know, futuristic technology. It can be a a piece of shit thing from 1980s just sitting on the sidewalk, you know, on the outskirts of town. But the idea to me is like every piece of the city has some form of tech, whether it's low grade or high end. So, you know, and that's how I sat up Atlanta, which is where the story of Cobalt takes place. Mm -hmm. So, of course, the inner city in mid Atlanta, midtown Atlanta is very much the bright, you know, futuristic looking Tokyo, you know, buildings everywhere, just bright lights. You know, everybody's wearing this great, beautiful fashion. The and then when you, exactly. And then when you start getting to the outskirts of Atlanta, where shit actually takes place, mm-hmm. you start getting the looks of Blade Runner. You start getting the looks of, you know, Double Dragon. You get the looks of Mario Brothers. You see where you see where I'm going with the cyberpunk idea. Yeah. So you know, there there are many different forms of cyberpunk to take place, but it can also those many different forms can take place within a capital mm-hmm. of a of a state. So Atlanta is a great place to do it. I didn't want to do it in New York, even though you've got the five boroughs. Because New York's saturated with superheroes already from Marvel, uh, IDW, DC. Everybody's up there. And then over in California, you even have some. You even got uh, Green Arrow and the Emerald City up in Seattle. Mm -hmm. So I was like, what hasn't been touched yet? And for some reason, it's Atlanta. And I lived in Atlanta for three years. So I was like, I know the layout. I can kind of, you know, spruce it up and mix it up a little bit. And that's what I'm doing. I'm pretty, so, sure, uh, I'm pretty sure even in a cyber even in a cyberpunk high tech future, Atlanta traffic is still shit. Bro, I wanted to set a detonator every time I ran through that shit. <laughs> <laughs> like, the I only, mean, the only nice thing that I can say about Atlanta traffic is that it's not as bad as LA traffic. That's it. That's only because you have more lanes. <laughs> well, it doesn't even matter that you have more lanes because all those are backed in too. I, I stand I stand by Bill Burr when he says COVID should have taken out a few more people. Nobody I know, love, or respect, or idolize, but, you know, the people that I don't know. <laughs> Which, um, when you say the people that you don't know, I keep, think, I keep thinking of that Twilight Zone story about the box. <laughs> Fair enough. You know, 
that. If you if you don't, for those who don't remember, it was a it was a story that um first that first showed up as a um short story, then got adapted into a Twilight Zone episode in the seventies, and then a film. Um, it actually got adapted twice into two different incarnations in in um in uh, the Twilight Zone. Um, where you have you have a couple who are down on their who are down on their luck, and they're approached they're approached by a dis- a man who has a disfigured face, and he hands them a box. Mm-hmm. Inside the box is a button, and if you if you press the button, you'll be given ten thousand dollars, but someone you don't know will die. And the two interpretations throughout the Twilight Zone had two diff had two different endings, because a lot of mm-hmm. it is the, is them debating about whether or not they're even going to push the button. Um, the first ending was they push the button, they get the cash. He takes the box and he says. We can. I can assure you that I can assure you that it w- that the box will be given to someone you don't know. Um, mm-hmm. You know, a bit a bit of classic ambigu a classic ambiguity because they might be the next. They might be killed by the by the box by somebody yep. else. Um, in the in one in one of the alternate endings, um, the husband ends up pushing the box, and then the next the next night his his wife um gets hit by a train and is killed and the man simply says well i get i guess you didn't know your wife damn um, i'm on the fence about which ending is better one the first one has the classic ambiguity you expect from the twilight zone but the other one yeah. it um works very well as a kind of dark fairy tale almost definitely um but definitely falls into those old stories of you know where it's supposed to be teaching you a lesson at the end, like all the old folklore tales should. Mm-hmm. But yeah. But now, when it comes to when it comes to no, when it comes to noir and hard boiled, which which mm-hmm. um, which kind which kind of intersect with each other. Um, I now I've had my own definitions of noir and ne- and neo noir, but. What, but how do you def- how do you define and interpret that in a storytelling con- context, and how does the neo noir um, aspect um, play itself out in um, Cobalt? Neo noir to me is just taking that like very dark, gritty look, mm-hmm. kind of like it's 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 an overused example, but uh, Sin City. Kind of like that, kind of noir type, you know, hard boiled, yeah, crime suspense, you know, detective kind of work going on, mm-hmm. and just the neo side of that is, uh, you know, just glowing lights every once in a while for one scene, one setting. It should it should have meaning behind when it's presented, but it doesn't always, you know. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, that's what neo noir is to me. It's just you know a, a grittiness with. M- not really a silver lining, but just just enough there to give you a little bit of hope to keep you coming back. Yeah, I do remember reading a um, a piece by by a um, sco- by a scholar who had who had said that a, said that a lot of the asp- a lot of um, neo noir is a ref- was a reflection on the time when that particular style of storytelling first came about, which was um, post World War One. Mm-hmm. Um, and because and because of that, you te- if you look at a lot of noir stories, you tend to have the you tend to have the um gr- the grizzled veteran who's who's come back and who's come back from seeing some shit, um, whether mm-hmm. it, whether it be the war to end all wars or whether it be some some other kind of trauma. But basically, they've 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 put a hardened shell around themselves because of that and. That the opposite end of that is some is some representation of youthful hope that cracks open that shell. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, obviously, I could I kind of put it better. <laughs> yeah, obviously, obviously that's not ev- that's not every story, and Sin City is is dri- is dripping with cynicism um, and blood. <laughs> yeah, large, largely because it was. Remember when Frank? Remember when Frank Miller was a sane person? Pepperidge Farm remembers. Yeah, it didn't last very long. <laughs> um, I think when it comes to, when it comes to him, I think the I think the issue is that he was always doing some sort of dark stories, but he didn't have anything to really balance himself out. Um, right. Like you look at say, 
you look at you look at somebody like Junji Ito, who does these hor who does these nightmare fuel body horror kind of stories in his manga, and yet outside of that, he's a complete dork. Like he's he spends he spends most of his time laughing at cat pictures. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, you know, you gotta get those those inner thoughts out somehow. Yeah, but you know, it's kind of. It's kind of like putting a little bit of yourself in something that you're not allowed to, like, when you go out into society, you know. It's something that you get to play around with, and, you know, that's one of the creative things, you know, that you do when you create a comic. I mean, uh, a little bit of those tidbits definitely fall into cold ball. It was very cathartic for me, you know. Uh, I was an amputee. There's very much inspiration in that within the characters within cold ball. Jesse Jensen... You know, very similar outtakes, but put with a spin with a comic book spin on how things took place, and uh, you know, just you know, him working through his things, how I worked through my things. It's very similar, but uh, you know, it's been it's been a growing process, and now uh, making it to where this character has to grow into something more than just you know, a vengeful, angry, you know young adult i mean you know it speaks volumes to many people out there that have gone through some kind of traumatic loss to begin with so there's very much something to relate to on every level he's a he's an older brother uh he's trying he's trying to balance the life of you know trying to become you know a hero slash vigilante and also still trying to be you know a decent guardian for his little brother not just you know somebody that has the the title, but doesn't have any of the emotion behind it, any of the uh, warmth behind it. So it's very much him, uh, his family and friends trying to pull him back in from this um, underlying rush of adrenaline and um, kind of cloaking the responsibilities that he should be taking care of. Mm -hmm. um, now, Winnick, now, when it comes to when it comes now, you mentioned you mentioned go, you mentioned using at using um at using Atlanta as the as the centerpiece, right? Um. Now, gi given that given that within within a lot of no within a lot of noir stories, the location it's the location itself is as much of a character as the actual cast is. Mm -hmm. Um. Since you since you mentioned Sin City in in that regard, um, ba um as it's known as ba as the official name of Basin City, you ha you um it's teaching you as much about as much about the inner workings of of various areas in the city as it is telling the um bunch of bunch of stories that it does. Um, mm -hmm. Within Co within yeah. Cobalt, would you say that Atlanta is a is a character in this story? I would say Atlanta is the Sybil <laughs> character. Many different faces within this one uh, character. Mm -hmm. But so you know, Atlanta. There's very much you know, uh, the world that people see just at face value, and then of course there's everything that go that's going on behind the scenes. And then there's different parts to Atlanta, you know, um, there's, there's, there's uptown, there's downtown, there's midtown, there's the outskirts, there's the suburbs, there's the urban cities, uh, and then there's the small towns all laying around it. And each one of them dabbles with a different um, class of people so you've got you've got you know you've got your poor you've got your wealthy you've got your in-betweens and you've got you know those that play both sides so there's very there's atlanta very much as a character within itself but again with all the different uh players within the city there's also many different uh settings or backgrounds or you know, faces that can be brought to it. 
now when it when it comes to when it comes to when it comes to now the setup that you had for for the thing is mm -hmm. um oh is is essentially Atla essentially Atlanta is dealing with a bit of a chaos problem since um the car with yeah. a with the dismantlement of a major cartel and now everybody's trying to fill in the power vacuum right um with yeah the, so um, everything's very much unsettled right now yeah uh you know so you de you definitely see that so the cartel that was taken out it was known as the Aranya and uh you learn you learn about them mostly in the seven-page origin story that I included from Super Abled into the back of Cobalt Atlantis Thrashing. Mm -hmm. But you definitely get uh, tid pieces of them talking about the past experience before I introduce uh, those characters again later down the line. But um, so right now, the the gang that we're uh, focusing on this time around are the Thrashers, hence uh, Atlantis Thrashing. You know, there's there's very much this um, lashing out between, you know, the different gangs trying to get that one spot. But right now we're focusing on the Thrashers and who they're working with to try and get some merchandise around Atlanta and what exactly is the merchandise and how many different players are trying to stop them versus who's, who's in whose pockets and who's really is on, you know, whose side. Mm -hmm. Um as a hockey fan, it is amusing to me that that you're, that the name that you picked is Thrashers. <laughs> <laughs> if I didn't know any better, I'd have, I'd have assumed that was intentional. The, th the Thrashers were intentional, yes, but not because of that. <laughs> it's actually a really lame ass reason why I picked Thrashers, and I don't want to give it away, but I will. Uh, the the Georgia State bird is the brown thrasher, man. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I just thought I thought it would be very uh, funny and ironic that this biker gang calls, them thr calls themselves the thrashers. And I base it off of a little fucking three inch brown bird, you know. So it's all, it's all the uh, the thrashers are basically the older generation within this uh, universe. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, it's very much leather jackets, uh, biker pants, you know, it's full clad on, uh, you know, motorcycle attire. But the difference is that I kind of got inspired by an actual gang that takes place down there in Atlanta. They don't have a name to them yet, but they're very much, um, they definitely, uh, their vehicle of choice is the ATV. And they've been stopped many different times by police because they've been known to like drive in huge groups down the highways and interstates through Atlanta. And they'd get pulled over and be told to cease and desist and stuff like that. So they were very much just, you know, uh, hitting a bit tongue tied there. Yeah, a little bit. <laughs> uh, Oh. They very, they very much were like, uh, you know, just delinquents, mm -hmm. you know. So I, that's where the threat, the idea for the Thrashers came from. Yeah. Now, give now. Um, it's a very bold, it's a very bold move to have that kind of in medias res, um, setup. Mm -hmm. um, especially since for, I'd say for a lot of people, this is more or less a hero origin story. Yeah. Um, and given 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 that given that one that one of your um one of your uh, one of your goals is to set is to is to set up the is to set up the hero in this regard. Um, what were some of the things that have that you've seen in other or quote unquote origin stories that you wanted that you wanted to avoid when it came to Cobalt? Uh, avoid. Mm -hmm. I'd say having a an actual kind of like
it's not it's not the right term I want to use, but it's the only one coming to mind. I don't want to have just knockoffs knockoffs of famous characters. I want I want these characters to resonate on their own. Mm -hmm. I don't want I don't want them to be I don't want somebody to be able to point out and be like, dude, that was exact that was uh, ripped off from such and such. You know, like people say about Homelander mm -hmm. or Omni Man. You know, that's just Superman you know, in a different setting. And I'm just like, yeah, if you want to dumb it down and break it down to like piece by piece like that, sure. But the way these characters interact and the histories that these characters have are completely different. So are you, are you doing a disservice saying that about the characters or are you just, you know, trying to get a little, you know, get a little jab in there and then be on your way? I don't know. But I really wanted to try and make uh, all these characters kind of like stand out on their own. Mm -hmm. Now, that the, now one of it now if I'm not mistaken, one of the major themes that you ha that you had with the story is um, is Je is Jesse Jensen trying to trying to um, trying to balance trying to balance his his um, life as Jensen as well as as well as um, the ide the identity of Cobalt and the struggles that occur trying trying to keep trying to keep those two in um in harmony with each other right um, yeah it's it i can i can already see that it's going to be difficult for him because at, at, as the writer you want you want to do the action scenes a whole lot you just want to get to the ass kicking you know and you you know saving the day and stuff like that mm -hmm. and uh but you have to balance that out with you know character development what makes this person tick? What what drives him? What keeps him ticking? What are some of his faults? What are some of his dislikes? What are some of his failures? And, you know, all that is encompassed within, you know, who he is at this point. And uh, you can also see how his little brother Isaac just yearns to, you know, be part of his brother's life again. Um and he's not really getting that at this point because Jesse is just so full of anger. Uh, in the origin story, he lost his hand. He lost. Uh, he feels like it's his fault that they lost their mother, and he's very much just on this path of destruction. And uh, his mentor slash friend Thomas Rogers uh, is very much trying to keep an eye on him without being too obvious about it, but he's not doing a real good job about it. Mm -hmm. So, um, while he's trying to like keep a wrangle on Jesse, he's also trying to like remind him, Hey, you've, you've got a 12 year old responsibility right over here. You need to kind of like deal with too. He's, he's going through some of the shit you're going through at the same time, man. So why don't you just, you know, sit down and talk to him about it for a little bit. Mm -hmm. And he's he's very much trying to dive into the other world so he doesn't have to pay attention to it. Yeah. And you can kind of see it play out. Now when now um when it comes to one one of the thi one of the things that struck that um certainly that certainly struck me when I when I look at the when I look at the pages of Cobalt is the um is the art style. I, I ended up likening it to a, to a to a, to having some elements of Ashley Woods art style, but a but a lot more clear. But there's a lot of yeah. but there's a lot of that same emphasis on a more watercolor like aesthetic. Was that was that something that was your idea, or is that something that your um, artist had recommended? That's what I wanted for the future of Cobalt. Um, I wanted. So when you look at uh, the pages of uh, Cobalt within Super Abled, mm -hmm. it's very much just, you know, regular comic book-esque. You know, I'll try and show you. But you can see how clean the lines are, how much brighter it kind of is. Yeah. Okay. So, and I liked it. No, I'm not knocking uh, the artist that did those pages for me. He's a great artist. He's a great guy. His name's Jacob Newell. You can mm -hmm. find him on Instagram. And, uh, I loved his work and I loved working with him, but since I'm not really doing a comic for kids now, I wanted to go a little bit darker with it. I wanted to get a little bit more gritty. 
I wanted to get into the actual emotion of emotional drive of COBOL. And I believe that is very much emphasized within the art artistic styles that uh, my artist Irwin's brought. Yeah, I can I can certainly um, I can certainly see that. Um, that's that's ultimately why why, given given that you wanted to do a dark a darker story is is um, is that is that the reason why why you um why you wanted to go for the, um more. I want I want uh, more. Re I hate using the word realist. But that's but that's yeah. the but that's the best word I can come up with for the time being, when it comes to when it comes to character design, when it comes to shape, when it comes to shading and the like. Right. Oh. Uh, the realism was just uh, a byproduct of what I was looking for. Um, I very much wanted a darker, grittier, rougher looking style for this time around. And it might change up down the line, who knows? But at this point in time, I very much love the artistic um, style that I have. Like um, the cover artist is Max Bertolini. Mm -hmm. He's done covers for not only Dark Horse Comics, but Heavy Metal Magazine. And I don't know why I chose it or why I was drawn to it, but his realistic style really resonated with me at this point. And it's very beautiful art. He does an insane job. And uh, I, just, I just hit him up out of nowhere and asked him if he would do this piece for me. I told him what uh, Cobalt came from and what I'm trying to do now. And he was like, hell yeah, man, I'll knock that out for you. Mm -hmm. And he did a great job. He not only did the cover art, he did the uh, metal trading cards that everybody, all the early backers are going to get. Mm -hmm. So this right here was also his art. And... Uh, you know he's he's a fantastic artist. I absolutely fell in love with his uh, stuff. And um, as for the the interior work from Irwin, you know it was it's to me it's just aesthetically pleasing. I love it. Um, I've had so much of just the normal, you know. Well, I don't I don't want to knock it because it's still beautiful art. But you know, just the the same old comic. Uh, Marvel and DC layouts, you know what I mean? Just clean lines, fantastic art, whether it's dark or bright, it doesn't matter. It all kind of like falls in the same line, you know what I mean? Yeah. But these, these, uh, the artistic style from Irwin, the lines aren't exactly defined, you know? Colors kind of like bleed out. Uh, the outlines of people's fingers and stuff might be a little bit more rough or chalked out. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And it, to me, I don't know why, but I love that aesthetic. I absolutely love it. And to go with what I'm going, trying to go for with cyberpunk and a neo noir type style. I mean, I, I think that hit a nail on the head. Yeah. Um, now when it, now one of the other things I found, I found kind of, I found kind of interesting when it comes to when it comes to Col Cobalt and the um, s and the setup that he has is first off, um, it very much ha it very much has the look of the of the kind of the kind of dark hero VHS movie that w that I might that somebody might have seen in the mid '80s. Sure. Um, maybe even maybe even late '80s. Um, but also uh, but also the cho the choice of to of Tonfas as the, as the signature weapon, which um. Even 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 with all even with all the glut of we of weapon use in street level heroes, it's something you don't see all that often. I know, right? It's usually just a straight blunt stick with no handles on the sides. <laughs> yeah. I I e Daredevil, Nightwing, Moon Knight. I mean, you know. But uh, Tonfa's. Ever since I was little, I I liked the idea of the Tonfa. You know, just you know. A, a defensive yet offensive weapon that goes right up against your forearm. Mm -hmm. So it always feels like it's part of you. It's not laying out here where somebody can grab it. It's very much close combat that you have to get in there and you actually have to know what the fuck you're doing. Otherwise you're going to get pummeled. Yeah. And, uh, but, um, some of the ways that 
So my artist Erwin, he's from the Philippines, and tampas are a Filipino weapon. So he very much, you know, when I'm looking at the tampas and I'm like, oh God, I hope he uses the tampas the way that they're supposed to, not just fucking helicopters like Raphael does in Rise of the TMNT. And uh, lo and behold, man, he he straight up knocks the hell out of some of these characters in this book, man. Like he just lays them out with it. And I love the way he, he uses them and utilizes them. So yeah. it's it's very much, you know, on the same wavelength of what I wanted. Mm -hmm. I will I will admit that the that the color setup, the mask, and the uh, ch and the chest plate, especially on the cover. Um, oddly oddly enough, I get a I get a very Showa era Tokusatsu vibe from that kind of thing. Uh -huh. um, yeah. Especially especially stuff like um, I'd say I'd say I'd say I'd say to an extent. Um, Giver, although, although that, although that's me push, that's me pushing it a bit because the first Giver movie was an attempt, and the second one is somewhat better. But there you go. But, um, <laughs> yeah. It's still, it's still the curse of trying to bring a manga into live action. You know how this goes. Um, yeah, bro. I'm. I'll be honest. I couldn't. I couldn't set through them. I just had. I had to look at stills. <laughs> um, although. Although I, I do re I do recommend Giver too to any to anybody who anybody who likes some de like some decent um, tokusats, but the big one I'll give it a shot if you recommend it. Um, also as also as a young David Hayter in in the starring role, you know pre solid oh. snake days. Oh, I gotta go see it then. <laughs> I love um, David Hayter. But uh, but um, I'd say I'd say one of the one of the big in, one of the um big. For what for whatever reason, inspirations that I'm that I'm looking at with, with it with this kind of set with this kind of setup is th is things like um, mechanical violator Hakider. Okay. Yeah. Um, which which was part which was part of it which was part of a film festival in um in to in Tokusatsu in '87 I want to say. Mm -hmm. Around around that time. And. Of course, of of course, given the color palette, I could I could also br I could also bring up um, Space Sheriff Gav um, Gavon, um, if o if only to discuss the Japanese Chuck Norris that is Kenji. <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough, man. Uh, yeah, but what? But um, were there were there any um were there any were there any kind of bullet points that you gave the artist when it came to does when it came to designing that particular armor? Uh, yeah, let me, let me see. I don't, let's see. Uh, on me, we can't share screens, can we? Um, yeah, I, be, I believe you, I believe you can. I just, I, I don't know how, um, you, I, you get it. either way. Mm -hmm. I, I remember the details that I asked for anyway, but, um, mm -hmm. I was going to show you what my first rough draft of cobalt was. And let me, it's hilarious. So, the the key points that I had was um, I very much wanted it to be a street level vigilante, mm -hmm. very much one that looks like a rough them um, up kind. I didn't want you know an acrobat, you know, on the front page. I didn't want you know somebody doing jumps and you know cartwheels and stuff like that. As much as I grew up with that, because Nightwing was my first comic. I did not want to, of course, replicate that. And uh, so what I asked for was all the, the rougher looking characteristics I could of other, of other characters kind of like wrapped into one. And so I, I asked him, I was like, this is what I'm looking for. I'm looking for a street level vigilante. I want uh, Josh Brolin's haircut from Deadpool 2. I want an elevation mask, a high tech elevation mask, kind of like that of, uh, which didn't actually come into play until after I had already made uh, 2019 Cobalt. But uh, you know how Red Hood updated his look to where it looks like he's just wearing a fucking hoodie with an elevation mask on? Yeah. Okay, kind of like that is what I was going for. And then I just wanted like a sleeveless. Uh, armored tank top 
That way he could actually like move around a little bit and not be held back from such bulky armor. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, of course, you know, I wanted, you know, a four fingered bionic guy. That's what I wanted. (laughs) So, (laughs) yeah, definitely, definitely not throwing any similarities in there whatsoever. And, uh, well, there's an old adage about writing what you know. Exactly. And, uh, that's very much in here. Mm -hmm. And then of course, every, you know, a street level type has some type of utility belt. So I was like, man, just, just give me like a little utility belt. That's black and kind of goes with like military style, uh, Mm -hmm pants and uh, boots and the rough draft of that was very much Jason Todd with his new red hood update. And I was like, I don't, I don't want that. We need to take it away. It's a little bit too on the nose. Yeah. So I was like, I wasn't even trying to go for Jason Todd. It's just how that turned out for that. And so, uh, uh, my artist was like, hey, man, do you want me to tinker with the armor a little bit? What aesthetics do you actually want of it? And I was like, all right. What I actually want from it is kind of like the armor from the armor of Stormtroopers or Mighty Morphin Power Rangers, the movie from the 90s, that kind of like hard but yet versatile, held together by elastic mesh type look. Yeah. That way he can still be mobile, move around, but it still looks like it can take a hit. And then just as an homage to Dick Grayson, give me the blue, the blue, the blue V kind of look for the shoulders up from the chest. And he was like, got it. And uh, from that point on, I just kept on like throwing little trinkets at him. And I was like, hey, man, can we get like a like a guard around his neck or something so no knife can get in there or whatever? And uh, he was like, I got you, man. Don't worry about it. Just just sit back and wait. And so I sat back and waited. And uh, lo and behold, man, that uh, character concept that he came up with was just beautiful. It was everything that I wanted, and I could not think of a more badass-looking character than Cobalt. Mm-hmm. Um, now with now um, with it within within that. Now I know I know that you're sh- I know that you're shooting for about thirty-two pages, but is is do you have in that 32 pages do you have it set up like a three act structure uh yes so you know every every story has to have a mi- beginning middle and end even if the even if the overlying story arc is spread out through you know i don't know four to seven issues you know give or take but um you definitely see me setting up different ideas that will be looked at later on down the road when I make more issues. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, you've got, you got the introduction, you've got the setup to what needs to be taken care of. You've got other players introduced that are going to be part of it. And then you have the ending finale that sets up, uh, the next issue. Mm-hmm. So you very, you very much get to see everybody's, uh, personality bleed through so nobody's gonna nobody should come off as just you know standing there to take up space yeah now at the time of this recording the um cobalt atlantis thrashing is it is in um in demand um yes now what what is the what is the current stat what is the current status you have regarding regarding the um print regarding the printing and and fulfillment I just sent an update to all my backers, mm-hmm. uh, pardon me, and on uh, the the Cobalt um, Indiegogo campaign mm-hmm. right before we got on uh, got on here. So where we are at is all the rewards have been fulfilled except for the for the one that we just hit this past week. We just hit the five thousand uh, dollar tier, an extra two thousand dollars from what our three thousand dollar goal was. So now we are working on the um, the new trading card that's going to be done by my interior artist Irwin, and uh, I, he just he just gave me the thumbs for that, and I it's it's going to look great. It's going to be awesome, mm-hmm. and uh, I actually gave I actually uh, sent a picture of the thumb out on the update. With my updates, I like giving out pictures of what everything has been completed and where we're at. 
I think I think that just gives a little bit more to let people know that, hey, I am serious about this. I do want to fulfill and I want to get you a book and I want to continue doing this because this is my first campaign that I've done alone. I was part of Super Able, but I didn't run that campaign. I just gave my origin story to that campaign. Mm-hmm. And uh, but yeah, so, you know, as a as a first time creator, I hear it from all the backers, you know, you got to fulfill, man, you better be timely, stuff like that. So, you know. It's it's right there just poking me in the back and you know my uh my fulfillment deadline uh is this month July and I'm very much uh you know <laughs> getting close to the end of that but um you know so where we are with that is all the physical rewards are here they're all around me um so this is the metal cover art print that we've done for cobalt if you backed it at the 60 dollar tier uh the featured tier of course uh we hit our uh four thousand dollar mark and so you know shay the red she wanted uh patches she loves patches so i was like i'll go ahead and do tail in studio patches Mm -hmm. uh we have the 11 by 14 poster print with art by bert de la cruz Albert de la Cruz. And you can see how Esmeralda, the one that actually took his hand is the backdrop. She's actually a bad bitch. I can't wait to use her again. She'll be back. And, uh, so, and then here's the 12 by 18 metal print with art by, uh, Instagram artist that calls himself Bagus artworks. Mm-hmm. So, there's that. And today in the mail, I actually received my sample book for Cobalt. So that's how close we are. We're at the printers, and I'm working with them to get all the bugs kink worked out before we actually print it. So uh, the order's already in. I've already paid for it. I'm just waiting to correct things because when you put – apparently when you put the PDF into a printing machine, things can get a little wonky somehow. So you you can uh, have you have you uh, done campa- campaigns before? I'm not sure. I haven't I haven't done campaign I haven't done campaigns myself personally, but I have okay. um I have had experience with trying to print my own PDF projects. Um, okay. And so you so you can, can see right here uh, where page nine is and where page ten is supposed to be. Page twenty two shows up for some reason. Yeah. So. So yeah, somehow chunks of different parts of the story got mixed up somehow in the PDF. So I just emailed them back and told them that. I was like, hey man, something's a little wonky. Parts of the story are mixed and jumbled up and everything. And he was like, all right, man, we'll get to work on that. And I just and I also told him, I was like, uh, we looked at some of the the lighter colors that are in the book and where it's supposed to be brighter with the neons and whatnot. So I have Joe Catapano from star circuit working on highlighting those colors for me before we send it back to him. So that's where we're at. We're ju- we're just polishing it up a little bit before I actually send it and give the okay. We're right there, man. We're, in, we're getting close to the end of July, but we're right there where I want to deliver. So and I'll, I'll, certainly, yeah. I'll certainly be looking forward to seeing how to seeing how things play out on that front. But almost definitely, I I sent the update out saying we are we are getting to the end of July. I'm still holding out for it, but fulfillment might take place in August. Mm-hmm. But that is that is definitely at the latest. Yeah, and with with all that with all that said, in the in the interest of not, of not jinxing you. Thank you. I appreciate it. <laughs> um, but I do want to give my thanks to to you for taking the time out of your schedule and com- and coming up to the temple to enjoy the insanity at play here. And nah, I appreciate you having me here, man. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. <laughs> Amen to that. <laughs> And of course, a sincere thanks to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come and listen to the madness at play here. And there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. 
But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody. Ha <laughs> ha!